Hello, everyone. My name is Kyle Matthews. I'm on the board of the Canadian International Council in Montreal. Uh, we're very pleased to have you today for this uh, lunchtime discussion on foreign policy. Uh, the CIC is a, is, a, is a think tank in Canada that engages Canadians to discuss foreign policy, help us understand what's happening outside of our borders, how it impacts Canada. So we're really, really pleased to have another session today. Uh, and today we're going to be having a very important talk about South Africa at a crossroads. And we're having this with a conversation with Terence McNamee. Um, Terence has, is a Canadian. He's been working in South Africa for quite some time. And he really has a unique perspective on South Africa, living there and seeing what's happening now. There's a lot of stuff in the news about South Africa, uh, you know, not condemning uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Um, there, there's a lot of things going on in South Africa, which is one of the most important countries in sub-Saharan Africa, if not the most, which some people say. Uh, but I would like to may just say a few words about, uh, about Terence. Um, he's got a very distinguished and, and a long bio, so I won't read all of it. It was, uh, it, it was on the event, right? But basically, just say a few words that, um, uh, you know, he previously held positions as a visiting expert to the PRISM group, uh, ISAF, X base in Kabul in Afghanistan. He was a member of the Atlantic Strategy Group in 2016 at the German Marshall Fund and is a member of the Harvard University South Africa Fellows Selection Panel 2012-2017. And Terence is uh, currently a Global Fellow of the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C., and Chairman of the Institute for Continuing History in Australia. Um, and Terence has, you know, has a background in international security, international cooperation, has worked, done amazing stuff in South Africa and across the planet. So um, I know that didn't do you justice, Terence, but maybe I'll just pass <laughs> the floor to you, let you speak for about uh, 20, 25 minutes. We'll have a discussion among each other, and then, then hopefully people following will, will pose questions via uh, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Facebook. So um, with that being said, Terrence, the, the floor is yours. Tell us about why South Africa is at a crossroads. Oh, Kyle, uh, 25 minutes. It's actually not a lot of time to unpack how South Africa got to this uh, state in its democratic history. Um, you know, there's no doubt that the country is in a crisis, but it's been in a crisis for, for more than a decade. So we almost don't have a kind of vocabulary to describe what's going on. Um, so it's a big challenge. I, I would say at the outset, because and it's great to be chatting to Canada, but my presentation might be a little bit do, uh, doom and gloom. But on the positive side, um, I do know South Africa's a uh, new high commissioner in Ottawa who recently arrived. And I have to say, um, without heaping too much praise on him, uh, I think this is going to be a golden era for Canada-South African relations. Um, I think he's an extremely capable high commissioner who knows a lot about Canada uh, and certainly knows a lot about diplomacy. So on that positive note, let me cascade down um, to some of the big, big challenges. Um, there's a number of ways you could really talk about this subject. Um, a purely economic lens, if you want to look for that, I would recommend very much uh, Ricardo Hausman of Harvard University. He was an advisor to Tabo and Becky in the 2000s, and he's just produced a terrific report on the really economic doldrums that South Africa finds itself in. My presentation will be a bit more in the political space, uh, but also you can look at South Africa from a historical lens. We can never forget how, how um, the specter of South Africa's wretched past really looms over everything that we understand today. Um, so I won't be able to give you a total picture. Um, my take is very much an impressionistic one and very much informed uh, by my, my own experience of the country. Um, I came here in 2010. And so I've kind of seen this journey from the FIFA World Cup uh, to where we are now. Uh, but maybe let's start in 1994. And it was that year where South Africa became, in the words of a famous journalist, another country. And to some extent, it did. Um, effectively overnight, you had a political and legal framework uh, that had been in existence for 45 years, uh, was no more. And South Africa moved to non-racial, multi-party democracy, one person, one vote. I mean, this was unimaginable uh, 10 years earlier. So we can never forget how quickly and how far South Africa went in a relatively short period of time. Um, 
and what would people have imagined, I think, in 1994? I wasn't here, uh, but people would have imagined a country that was on a path of progress. And what did progress look like? Well, in 1994, looking ahead, you would have thought, well, we're going to have a country that's going to have um, a dispassionate and competent public sector. Um, we're going to see significant reductions in political and non-political violence. We are going to see a fairer and more equitable economy. We're going to see um, holistic Black advancement. We're going to see improvements to education. I mean, this is what progress was assumed to be. In the foreign policy domain, uh, there's no doubt that uh, Nelson Mandela had, to some extent, a utopian vision, uh, the idea that human rights would be the light that guided South Africa's foreign policy. Um, but at the same time, there's no doubt that South Africa was really a beacon and an inspiration, uh, not just for the world, but certainly for African development. And it had an enormous store of international political capital, which of course was due in part to the sheer personality, the force of Mandela's personality, but it also had to do with the country's inspirational uh, transformation process, its transition to democracy, its diversity. Um, there's a lot of talk about Ukraine in terms of denuclearization, but the reality is, is that South Africa is the only country to have built nuclear weapons and then to voluntarily dismantle it. So it had an enormous store of sort of international political street cred and its thriving economy. And, and there's a number of other things that um, you could mention. Of course, the country had enormous challenges. Um, the AIDS epidemic, um, rampant crime. But in the main, this was a story that you wanted to be a part of. Uh, and I certainly did. Um, when I came in here in 2010, Johannesburg felt like the center of the universe. Uh, it was a few months before the start of the FIFA World Cup. Uh, the economy uh, was rebounding from the global financial crisis. Um, the South African Rand was seven to one US dollars. Um, it was a really inspiring place to be. Um, and of course, Nelson Mandela was still alive, um, who served as a, a kind of reference point for the, for the country's better angels. Now, at the time, the president was uh, Jacob Zuma, and it's 2010. And you know, him and his cronies, they're, they're gnawing on the state, uh, but they're not yet gorging on the state. And I think that the, the kind of uh, the bonhomie of the World Cup sort of veiled their crimes at the time. And so you had a situation where there was still a decent measure of public faith in the country's leadership. Um, and of course, there was corruption, there was malfeasance, but you could imagine at the time that it was isolated. Um, this was not going to take over uh, the state. Uh, but of course, unfortunately, um, how wrong we were. Um, corruption and malfeasance uh, did not just become characteristics of the state, uh, they became its defining features. Now, Jacob Zuma was the president from uh, 2009 to early 2018. And that decade is essentially known as the lost decade for South Africa. Um, and what did that lost decade, I mean, in terms of the indicators of collapse of a state, I mean, I could, any laundry list would include uh, dramatic falls in economic growth, dramatic falls in foreign investment, um, collapse of the country's credit ratings to, to junk, um, runaway unemployment and joblessness, um, you know, collapse of the currency, collapse of property values. I mean, you could go on and on. And this financial collapse was mirrored in the political space where you had uh, institutions of state, state-owned enterprises that were really uh, world-beating organizations like the country's tax collection agency, um, the country's electricity provider. I mean, these were models of best practice, um, but they were totally destroyed in the, in the feeding frenzy of Zuma and his cronies. And that is, of course, one of the great tragedies of South Africa is that you, it takes a long time to build up institutions. It can take a decade or more, uh, but it can only take really a few months to destroy them if you get rid of uh, the capable leaders um, within them. So that was the sort of situation in terms of uh, on the domestic front. On the international stage, 10 years 
of shenanigans at home had a really damaging impact on South Africa's international reputation. A lot of its skill in terms of diplomacy and stuff just evaporated into this sort of culture of predation. And although South Africa has maintained its uh, membership of BRICS and the G20, its reputation both internationally and within the African continent is, uh, is nowhere near what it was in the 90s and the 2000s. But if we take, say, 2017, which was the height of what was called state capture, which was effectively malign actors who were associated with the president and his cronies, who were effectively taking over state-owned enterprises and using them as vehicles for massive, massive theft, theft on a grand scale you could still believe that there was a hope and there was a dogged hope within civil society, within business, uh, within the remaining fragments of honor within the political space, that if we could just get rid of uh, Zuma and his cabal um, and a new administration could come in and clean out the Augean stables that could renew the promise of the country, that could get it back on track. And lo and behold, South Africa was able to get the leader that they wanted in Cyril Ramaphosa. And we did experience a brief period of what was called Ramaphoria, um, where there was renewed hope uh, that we could right the ship. Uh, but it was fleeting, and it was unfortunately short-lived. Um, short-lived because joblessness um, increased. The economy did not get back on track. South Africa's politics continued to falter. Um, and so tragically, when we get to the start of 2020, I experienced something here which um, I had never witnessed before. And that was a different kind of crisis, not an economic or a political crisis, but more importantly, a social and a psychological one, a, a crisis of hopelessness within society that the country could not get back on track. So that was the start of 2020. And then the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And of course, the pandemic created challenges for, for countries around the world, immense challenges. But in the case of South Africa, because we had a decade which preceded its outbreak of effectively total political and economic failure, um, it was particularly devastating and has been devastating for South Africa. Um, sectors and industries have just been eviscerated and uh, the economy has been so badly exposed, um, tourism, but I could go on. And unfortunately, um, South Africa did not have at its disposal, um, like Canada has, uh, the means to ameliorate some of these big challenges uh, for companies and sectors uh, because South Africa simply didn't have a healthy fiscus as Canada did. So huge, huge challenge. Um, and so, you know, one of the questions would be, besides COVID, why did South Africa not, why was it not able to get back on the rails with a leader like Cyril Ramaphosa? Uh, and I would offer, you know, three or four issues to highlight, but there's many more. I think firstly, we probably underestimated just how systemic and structural the challenges are in South Africa. Um, after 1994, there was an opportunity to, for business and government to leverage the country's founding myths, its foundational experiences, which were in this case, um, the fight against apartheid and the transition to democracy. Those kind of foundational experiences to leverage them to create a more educated and empowered majority who could see progress within their own lifetimes. And that didn't happen. Instead, unfortunately, elite enrichment was prioritized instead. Someone might also make the argument um, with South Africa's famed Truth and Reconciliation Commission that, that occurred in the 1990s, that it's very much unfinished business, uh, that white South Africans in particular um, maintained their, their economic privilege uh, but didn't change their thinking. That's one argument. And that's a and that's a bit of a challenge for the society that you still have kind of apartheid mindsets, even though it doesn't look like that um, on the surface. So we think about systemic and structural issues as possible explanations. Um, secondly, just the scale 
the sheer scale of predation and corruption of the Zuma administration uh, was, was, was truly astonishing. Um, some have argued that this wasn't simply about the accumulation of wealth and feeding at the trough, but instead it was really a, a project. And that was a project to repurpose the state to effectively overturn South Africa's progressive constitution um, and effectively radically and in a very short period of time, change the nature of ownership of the economy and change it radically into black hands. So that's one argument that it just wasn't about predation, that it was actually about repurposing uh, the state. And then I think thirdly, we, we do have to look at President Cyril Ramaphosa as an explanation. This is someone who is, is most definitely a Democrat. This is someone who believes in open markets, someone who understands business, um, someone who understands the need to redress the wrongs of the apartheid past, as well as the wrongs of the last decade. Uh, this is someone who also has a very, very difficult road to navigate between the interests of the country and uh, the interests of his uh, party, um, which is a big challenge because his party holds his fate in his hands and the internal politics and ructions in that party, which I'll get to in a second, um, can be very, very tricky. But having said all of that, uh, wearing my historian's hat, how will historians judge Ramaphosa? Well, I think on balance at present, this is a time in South Africa's history where it demanded incredibly bold and courageous leadership to push through fundamental reforms. And on that score, I think Ramaphosa has come up short. Um, he has not lived up to uh, the hopes of the nation. He has been too timid, too gradualist in his approach. And I think that histori unless that changes, I think historians will judge him uh, negatively on that count. Uh, Kyle, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, and I'll say, a, perhaps say for a couple of minutes about South Africa's decision to abstain from the UN vote on the Russian invasion, um, which was effectively a show of support for Russia and perhaps in particular for Vladimir Putin. Now, South Africa has tried to justify this position on the basis of neutrality and non-alignment and its need for the international community to focus on peaceful resolution. It also has time and again emphasized the hypocrisy, especially in the West, over in the invasion of, uh, of Iraq, um, the invasion of, of uh, the operation in Libya, which is still a sore point amongst others. So th that's what the South African government has attempted to do. But I, I think it just doesn't hold water at all. And this is not a decision that was based on principle. I think it's for very, very party-centric reasons. The upper echelons of the ANC, at least some members, are closely, closely aligned to Putin and his regime. Uh, some of them, including the deputy president, go, it seems, fairly frequently for medical treatment in Russia, although this is always cloaked in um, all kinds of darkness. We have no idea what it is, nor why they would not seek medical treatment in South Africa, which if you pay for it, has very, very good medical treatment. So I don't think it's a decision born in principle. And I also think it's a, a fairly spectacular own goal internationally for South Africa and will further damage its, its reputation. Um, so we just experience a massive setback in the country from what the expectations and dreams were um, in the 1990s and the 2000s. Now, all countries, all new democracies experience setbacks on their nation building Germany. I, I mean, we're, I'm speaking to, you know, I'm Canadian and we're speaking to a Canadian audience. I mean, if we want to talk about setbacks, I mean, I voted in the 1995 referendum um, and obviously Canada came within a hair's breadth of, of splitting apart. <laughs> that would have been a very serious setback. So, you know, South Africa is not unique in that respect and nor in terms of the current polarization and fragmentation is it experiencing, um, is it unique? But I think what South Africa has to come to terms with is that post Mandela, post the 1990s, and 
the exceptionalism that kind of creeped into South Africa's self-perception, uh, that's no longer the case. I mean, South Africa has to come to terms, frankly, with its ordinariness. And it has to come to terms with the fact that what we imagined or what was imagined in 1994 was really a, a product of an extraordinary historical moment of Nelson Mandela and this, and this group of leaders who really, you needed a, another a next generation to really uh, have a ceaseless commitment to their vision. Uh, and that uh, unfortunately didn't, didn't happen. Now, if that dream, if the kind of Mandela dream of South Africa is gone and it's, it's, it's dead, then what replaces it? And I think that's really an open question. Um, it's possible that there's a, a fairy tale scenario where a talismanic leader um, emerges from some new or existing political formation uh, and can galvanize a critical mass of South Africans around them. But I don't think that is the case. I mean, I think that South Africa's future, unfortunately, at the moment, rests much more on quicksand than solid ground. But I hope I'm proven wrong, but, uh, but we'll see. Just a few observations, maybe about 2022. 2022 looks like it's going to be a very turbulent year for South Africa. And the main reason that is the case is not because of uh, Russia, Ukraine, but it's because the ruling African National Congress party has its electoral conference at the end of the year. And unfortunately, what happens in the party um, is effectively what happens in the country. And that's going to be a very tense period of political jockeying, of tensions, and most likely violence. And an important report has just come out in South Africa by a think tank, which argues that elite contestation within the ANC, so in other words, effectively fights for power within the ANC, is the greatest threat to political stability in South Africa and is the greatest generator of political violence or violence of any kind, in fact. And, and that's really an astonishing claim. And it's uh, a think tank has just produced this after you know, months of research. But it gives you a sense to the extent to which the country is really held hostage to what happens in the ruling party. And its December conference will, will show just how vulnerable the president is to being unseated or not. Um, it's really tricky because um, notwithstanding Ramaphosa's failings, I think his popularity, he's much more popular than the party that he leads. Um, and if he was to exit the scene, um, there are simply no good options waiting in the wings. So that's really, really worrying for South Africa. And when I say no good options waiting in the wings, unfortunately, that also goes to the opposition. Um, there's not really a viable political opposition within South Africa, which is a really, to some extent, an indictment of the democracy in the sense that over 30 years, we've not been able to build an alternative to the ruling party that can effectively hold them to account. In 2022, also, from a security perspective, is very worrying because the year started with an attempt uh, to burn down the country's parliament. I mean, you can't really start with something more perilous than that. And it does seem that there were some um, toxic political elements that were behind that. And six months before, South Africa had experienced the worst unrest and political violence it experienced um, in the democratic era. So the security situation is really, really worrying. Um, some questions, and I'll, and I'll end pretty quickly, Kyle. Um, and hopefully we can pick this up in Q&A, but just some things to sort of consider um, fairly random, but I think maybe if we're just alive or sensitized to some of these issues. Um, question, is South Africa finally going to move beyond this culture of transparency without accountability? I wish that was my phrase. That's one of my favorites, but it's actually a phrase of uh, Peter Lewis at Johns Hopkins University. So what we have, not just in South Africa, but actually it's common throughout Africa now, is that we know much more about what's going on. We know much more about the misdeeds and frankly, who is responsible for them. So we have more transparency, but we don't have the corresponding accountability. We don't have enough people going to jail, enough people losing their jobs, 
uh, enough accountability, enough reforms. So this issue of transparency without accountability, South Africa has just undergone uh, a multi-year commission of inquiry into state capture. And there's been lots of recommendations and lots of political, prominent political figures have been fingered. It remains to be seen whether they will actually be held accountable. And I raise that issue of accountability, knowing of course full well that the former president has spent a few days in jail, uh, but I would still hold to that point as issue. Um, really important issue at the level of the economy and politics, will South Africa be able to push through reforms like slashing the public service wage bill, building a meritocratic public sector, hugely, hugely important issues for the country? Uh, will it be able to broaden the tax base, expand the economy? Now, 5.8% of South Africans pay 92% of the country's personal tax. So again, 5.8% of the population pay 92%. So that's clearly an unsustainable situation. And what's also worrying, of course, is that um, compliance is falling away because very few South Africans believe that their money is going to be spent wisely. Uh, this issue of security is incredibly important. The security agencies have been decimated by the former president. Uh, people have very, very little faith, whether it's in the police. Um, in one report I just read in, in one province, I think it was the Western Cape, where 63% of the police services dockets uh, have been lost in their archives, 63% of police dockets lost. So that gives you extent in terms of failing security agencies. Uh, and another worrying thing, and I'll perhaps end on this, this is a country that has about 40% unemployment for adults and nearly 70%, nearly 70% unemployment among young South Africans. In a country where half of the adult population is poor, there's a tremendous reservoir um, that's building up for trouble. And a lot of that trouble may be directed towards the foreigners within South Africa. It's a country that has formed We've had lots of outbreaks of xenophobic violence. And unfortunately, that does appear to me to be one of the great threats on the horizon for this year is that we'll have another explosion of that. Um, I won't try and sort of neatly tie things up, Lyle, because I think I've, uh, Kyle, I think I've spent uh, 25 minutes already. So maybe we can pick up on anything in the, in the Q&A. Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks for that uh, really detailed overview of South Africa's you know, foreign policy, but also the challenges internally, political corruption, state capture, um, and and you know the, the staggering figures of unemployment and, and how that could be used politically down the road. Um, Terrence, I, I, I maybe would want to just ask two questions to you before going to the audience. Um, you mentioned about about violence um, and particularly about the the arson against the uh, South African Parliament in Cape Town. But you also said there was a wider security problem recently. Were you referring to Durban? And if it's Durban, can you maybe just tell Keynes about what happened and how it transpired? Yeah, thanks, Carl. So it wasn't just Durban. It was also Johannesburg. And, um, you know, not where I live in Johannesburg, but certainly areas of Johannesburg were very affected. So what happened was those supporters of the former president were effectively telegraphing the possibility that there would be violence and protest within the country and unrest if Zuma goes to jail. And he duly did go to jail and he was sent to jail. And within days, we had mass outbreaks of looting, of, of property, um, that was on a scale that was incredibly worrying. Now, this was not a spontaneous outburst. This is something that was politically orchestrated. Um, the government very soon after identified 12 individuals, uh, their names are still unknown, I think, who were the kind of ringleaders. And we expect to hear uh, of some high profile figures um, presumably aligned to the former president. Um, their names will apparently come out 
in the coming days. But the point was, is that this was a terrifying moment for South Africa, something that was an incredible gut punch to people's belief in the future of the country. It led to a hemorrhaging of um, money out of the country. Uh, and it frankly dented a lot of people's faith. It was the last straw. And we think about the brain drain and we think people, they think, you know, the specter of this happening again is just too worrying. So if I can get myself and my family out of the country, but this was tremendous looting and unrest and violence, primarily in Durban and neighborhoods, but also in Johannesburg. So, so going on to this, the violence and, and, um, and you talked about this crisis of hopelessness where a lot of South Africans, you know, are unemployed, don't see a positive future. And coupled with this violence, how serious is the brain drain problem? I mean, and, and I ask you this because I know there's been an enormous amount of migration into South Africa in the last decade from Zimbabwe, from others seeking opportunity, and, and there has been violence. But what are the numbers of people leaving South Africa now or trying to look at, at live? Like, is it, as, it, is, is it as a serious problem and is the government trying to deal with it? <laughs> So, Kamal, they purposely don't track such numbers. So you can't get any reliable figures. But what we have is sort of overwhelming anecdotal evidence. And I would take from my sort of personal experience, um, anecdotal evidence would come in the form of private schooling. So within South Africa, you have an incredibly unequal education system. And you also, as you know, the, well, as you may know, the World Bank just produced a report, I think last week, that put South Africa as the number one most unequal country in the whole world, even above uh, Brazil. Uh, anyhow, but at the top end of education, if I was to take five or six or seven years ago, in terms of the schools that sort of everybody wanted to get into in Johannesburg, um, there would be these massive waiting lists. Um, and it, you had to put your kid on the school list the, the day after they were born. Um, you don't have that problem anymore. And a lot of that has to do with not just the sort of expats like myself who have left, uh, but you have far, far who are, who are in the country paying them. Anyways, that's a bit of a sort of a random example, but they don't keep the evidence of the brain drain. But there, there's, there's simply no doubt in terms of the professional fields, when you speak to doctors, um, when you speak to lawyers, you say whatever, that um, the country is experiencing uh, a, a brain drain. We just don't have reliable figures. So we're going to go to questions from the audience. So I'm going to put one up on the screen, Terrence. So this one is coming in. We got it through Twitter. It says, what does the death of Desmond Tutu mean for South Africa? You know, you know, it's funny, Cal, because it, 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 to some extent, when we thought about the death of Mandela and he died in 2013 and, you know, how, how much does it matter sort of a single individual who's passed their time anyways, exits the scene. And actually living here in South Africa, I've sort of come to realize that it matters a great, great deal. And the reason why is because the passing of Tutu is such a dramatic, dramatic um, example of, or a dramatic illustration is that there's nobody to replace these figures. There's simply nobody in the country that embodies those kind of rainbow nation values. There's nobody that carries that kind of credibility in society like Mandela or like Tutu Kerry. You don't have those free thinking. And, and remember, Tutu, well, Tutu warned as early as 2010, 2011, that the ANC was going in an extremely dark direction. And it was going to become a threat to the stability of the country if it continued on this road. So we simply don't have figures like that in South Africa. So I think the person who answered that question 
kind of hit the nail on the head that it is very, very significant that someone like that exits the scene. And as I said before, these are a reference point for the country's better, better angels. And when they're not here, you know, the memory of them, frankly, is, is almost not enough. You know, their physical presence is needed. So, yeah, I think it's a, quite a big deal. I remember uh, that statement by Tutu criticized the ANC and it, it I mean, I, I think I, I read it in the New York Times and it, it was shocking to hear him say that, yeah. especially in particular his role in, in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So he says something. Another question coming in, um, I think this one's coming through Facebook. It says, why is there no alternative to the ruling ANC and what happened for that to be prevented? So you've mentioned this before about the ANC. There hasn't been, a, you know, any kind of, over 30 years, a strong democratic party is being created to challenge that. But, but give us some, some, a, a bit more background into why this has transpired. So I love, and you know, in Liberia, the, there was a great quote by Prince Johnson who said that the gun that liberates shall not rule. And although he didn't live up to his own um, fantastic uh, dictum, um, he certainly spoke to a really, really important issue of liberation parties in South Africa, or in Africa, Southern Africa, that come into power, whether it's ZANU in um, Zimbabwe, um, whether it's, um, you know, Frelimo in, in Mozambique, and, and, and so forth, is that those parties tend to take on a kind of a culture of ownership, a sense of ownership of the state as opposed to being their custodians. And it creates this really sort of pernicious culture where you cannot get a clear distinction between the party and the state. And that's what unfortunately has evolved within South Africa where the, the levers of power are all held within the party where you have people who are deployed so you're effectually capturing the state, but in a different way than, than President Zuma did that. And I think also within South Africa, you got something of a Stockholm syndrome, you know, where people can't even imagine another government or another leadership, despite all of their failings, than the ANC, uh, because it's so, been so dominant in people's, in people's lives. And why has a, a political alternative not come about. Well, South Africa has a very fragmented opposition. Um, there was perhaps hope about six or seven years ago um, that they might, but what you have, unfortunately, in terms of the opposition is that you have parties that are characterized. So you have a kind of a black nationalist party in the economic freedom fighters. You have um, a party in the democratic alliance, which is increasingly perceived is a kind of white ruled uh, party. Um, you, don't, you don't have a political formation that is bringing together a lot of different groups, disparate groups to hold the government to, to account. But, but yeah, it's, it's, it is a bit of a mystery after you know, 30 years, how the ANC is still able to pull in these numbers, you know, upwards of the high 50s or 60%, um, given how how much of a failure it has been in terms of governing the country. So Terrence, I have another question coming in. This one's coming in from YouTube and it says, uh, what do Canada South African relations look like knowing that Canada has rather disengaged from the African continent as a whole as a Canadian, um, what do you see as the Canadian South African relationship? Um, where does it go from here? You know, it's, it's really interesting Kyle, because for a country that not only was a stalwart foe of apartheid, but also played a really important role as a kind of mentor of South Africa's constitution. I mean, South Africa's constitution is, as you know, um, you know, draws and bill of rights draws on Canadian experiences and Canadian um, charter of rights and freedoms. Um, but I think, you know, <laughs> Unfortunately, one of the great tragedies of the J Jacob Zuma period is that, you know, the tug of South Africa, that inspirational story kind of ceased to exist 
And I think relationships became a lot more functional. Certainly from the Canada, South Africa relationships and Canada, Africa relationships, we have to first and foremost think about mining. Uh, mining still remains a sort of big relationship. But what you, when you get beyond that, um, it's, it, it's difficult and challenging. And as I said, you know, I have nothing but respect for the new high commissioner in Ottawa. And I think for South Africa, Canada relations, I mean, nothing better could, could happen because he's someone who is extremely shrewd and capable, knows both countries, and he'll, he'll try and do things, which is, which is great. Um, but I think overall, it's, it, it's, it's going to, you know, it's, it's challenging. It's really challenging. And it's very challenging dealing with the South African government. I mean, everyone will tell you that here. If you're a diplomat trying to sort of, you know, get through the sort of labyrinthine um, Department of International Relations and Cooperation is, is a big, big challenge. So on the positive, let me say again, on the positive, I think for Canada, South Africa relationships, there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential and, and we'll see if it's going to be realized. Well, Terence, uh, we've approached the 45 minute mark. Um, that's the end of our questions from the, from the online audience. So I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Canadian National Council for joining us today, for helping us think about South Africa, um, the ties to Canada and also what's happening there economically, politically and socially. I think it's a, it's a very important country that we need to keep an eye on. And we want to thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise today. Thanks, Cal. Great to be with you.